Hello everyone, my name is Aaron Standard. I'm the founder and CEO here at Petabridge, and today we are going to do a very special video. We are celebrating Petabridge's 10th birthday. Now on my personal channel, I've already done a video kind of talking about some of the business lessons I've learned while being at the helm of Petabridge for 10 years. But in today's video, we're actually gonna go ahead and discuss some engineering lessons. The 10 most important engineering lessons I've learned in the past decade of supporting me and our employees by working full time on Akka.net, our you know big open source project that we stand behind. So let's go ahead and dive in. These lessons are gonna kind of cover a broad swath of different areas, but I promise you'll find them useful. So the first big lesson is don't get cute. Lots of software developers, the first time they discover metaprogramming or reflection, want to use it everywhere. They want to use it to automate serialization or automate config or automate, you know, basically being able to do binding and all sorts of things like that. What this does is it introduces a bunch of complex, invisible moving parts that we generally refer to as magic. When the magic ceases to work or the behavior of the magic somehow changes, it creates the world's worst untraceable problems. And particularly if you're using this in an area like serialization, this means things like your wire format might be unstable now. So there's a, you know, it's no coincidence here that one of the big things we're doing with Akka.net, the next new version we just announced, Akka.net 1.6, is we're trying to move away from polymorphic serialization and move towards design time schema-based serialization. The entire idea is to avoid magic. Number two, if you can't measure it, you can't control it. If performance is a feature for your application, your service, or your library, you're going to want to benchmark it. You're going to want to have some way of being able to measure what's the end-to-end -end latency, or what's our total throughput, or what's our memory consumption, etc. You have to have some way of quantifying it. Next, if you're doing something like trying to distribute a public API or trying to distribute, let's say, an endpoint somewhere, you need to have some way of explicitly versioning things. This is where API approvals come in. Because if you don't measure and control that, you're going to end up rug pulling a whole bunch of people on your team or your customers or your users or whoever. And then finally, there's observability. I see an astonishingly large number of companies that are using Akka.net and other technologies at like billion dollar scale that are still using 1999 style observability, like power grep plus an IIS log, that type of thing. Uh, that's terrifying. You should take the time and effort to figure out how to properly observe your application. We've got plenty of videos and open telemetry here if you want to learn how, but this will help you keep two hands on the steering wheel while you're putting important software into production. Number three, locality is the biggest factor in distributed systems performance. If you're trying to build a SCADA system or maybe graph search or any other type of application where you have to hit lots of different nodes all within a, let's say, under 100 milliseconds in order to achieve a favorable result, you want to be operating in the intra-process band up here where every single messaging between actors happens on the order of individual single digit microseconds. In some cases, messaging might even take less time than that, it might be 500 nanoseconds, it kind of depends a little bit on the .NET scheduler. If you're using other tools, let's say like Dapper or Leans, you're going to be operating more often in this cross machine latency here. That's the downside of virtualizing actor distribution, which by the way is also what Akadot cluster sharding does. Akka.net by default generally operates here because whenever you call actor of, you're getting a local actor that is adjacent in memory in the same process. So if you're trying to really keep latency down and you want to be able to process lots of big bursts of messages, you have to have a hand on the steering wheel with how allocation works. And Akka.net is the simplest tool out there for being able to actually achieve that. Everything else has many more moving parts and is much more complicated by comparison. Number four, .NET threading. Generally speaking, if you're trying to get real improvements in your application's performance, fixing how you work with multi-threading, and this also means things like async await as well, is generally going to yield more significant results with less effort than trying to work on improving single-threaded execution. When you see those little benchmark infographics or some YouTube video talking about, yeah, you know, what's the fastest way to iterate through a collection, they're all talking about single-threaded execution. And the reason why that is such a popular topic in the .NET sort of content space is because it's really easy to measure. Benchmark.NET and other tools like it make it really easy to observe that and make it um, quantifiable. But generally speaking, if you want to get the most bang for your buck, 
Doing things like reducing context switching, this means getting more work done on a single thread of execution. We have a video where we talk about how we improve some of that in Akadon at 1.5. Leveraging parallelism and asynchrony, that's another area where you can get a lot of yield. And then finally, probably the biggest improvement area of all, getting rid of stupid flow control problems. A, waiting something that can run as a detached task or not doing things like task composition, that type of stuff. This is gonna be where your biggest performance improvements generally come from. Number five, version tolerance is a skill. So great engineers fear and respect versioning challenges. Versioning is not simple. It's one of those things that you basically people take for granted until it doesn't work very well. If you've ever depended on a project where they release like three major versions a month and you can't keep up with it, so you just pin it, that is someone who's not putting a huge amount of effort into versioning. And this is why it's such a big problem. The idea with version tolerance is you have to negotiate how do I bring not just the application's code, but also the data and the formats and the other applications it interacts with, how do I go ahead and gradually introduce changes to them in a way that doesn't completely collapse my network? So if you're building applications, version tolerance will show up in your wire format if you have things like web APIs or gRPC. It'll also show up in your database schema, and it might even show up in the types of APIs you expose, whether it's through binaries or through things like a web API or whatever. You wanna go ahead and develop a measured, explicit approach to managing all of this. And one of the big things that's really helped us that we've been doing for many years on the Akadonet project is we have explicit assertions that our versioning policy is being followed. We use like the API approver tool, then we use the verify library to go ahead and take snapshots of the output and a human being has to manually review those changes. And we basically know what's a breaking change and what's not. Sometimes there's still mis mistakes and issues, but generally speaking, we do a pretty good job of tamping down on that. This is something you should also try to apply to your own designs. One technique I recommend above all others for doing this is extend only design. I've got a blog post on that. I'll link to that in the description. Number six, beware developers who aren't curious about how things work. In your career as a software developer, you'll never regret learning you know, what the difference between IPv4 and IPv6 is or learning how domain name resolution works or learning how a TLS handshake works. Sure, you may not use that information at work very often, but when a problem does come up, you will know what questions to ask and where to look to go fix it. This will make you a more valuable contributor and it will make you more capable of solving pretty hard problems. Software developers who don't share this value, by contrast, are going to largely be producers of technical debt and dead weight for the most part. For instance, developers who know Entity Framework but not SQL. This person will flail like a turtle on their back once they start running into performance issues generated from the query they have synthesized with code first entity framework and you know basically the application joins and all the other sloppy stuff they're doing with really inefficient entity framework code. It's useful to know the low level details and developers who think, you know, that's not an important detail. I don't want to worry about that. That's infrastructure. I should just go about my business. These people are walking technical debt factories. The reason being is that software is a detail-oriented business. Your software is a collection of details that are important to you. Well, if something as significant as your schema, where all of your business data for your customers is stored, if that counts as an insignificant detail, you're going to get a lot of other bigger things wrong too. Because I guarantee you, those details are stacked on top of the little ones about how your database works. Number seven, Microsoft makes mistakes too. No software company is immune from introducing bugs. The Donna SDK, the runtime, the JIT, the garbage collection system, all the core libraries, they can and do ship with bugs. And you're not crazy for thinking this might be a bug that Microsoft has made. So I'll give you a little example of this here. Let me go ahead and drag this over. This is a bug from 2021, not long after .NET 6 shipped, we noticed a performance regression in the .NET 6 thread pool. And I'm not gonna go through the entire thread here, but lo and behold, we interacted with members of the .NET team, we sent them bin logs, we ultimately weren't able to fully reproduce it, but the Azure Cosmos DB team did. And it turns out, yes, there was a pretty significant regression in the way the hill climbing algorithm for allocating threads worked in the new .NET thread pool implementation that arrived in .NET 6. So the way to deal with this is you gotta treat the components Microsoft ships like they're any other dependency. Be respectful to the maintainers, 
file a bug, and hope they fix it. Number eight, good code eventually becomes functional in style and in its nature. A little bit of a hot take here, but mixing state and behavior, which is part of the premise of object-oriented programming, rarely works well in the long run. What tends to work better is actually separating these two concerns. And we talk about this in a lot of our design courses and in my video on application management best practices. Immutable data objects plus pure functions work best. By the way, this is like F sharps defaults for argument's sake. So I know most of the people here, including me, are all C sharp developers. Well, F sharps defaults are, are correct. This works best because it's easier to reason about things, easier to test, easier to retry. It ultimately leads to basically styles of code that are simple, understandable, composable, and safe. So good code that is maintained over many years gradually starts adopting styles like this. I would argue, as a software developer, embrace it, don't fight it. Object-oriented programming is the training wheels upon which pretty much everybody learned how to program, but functional programming is where you're gonna end up if you keep honing your craft over many, many years. So just embrace it. Number nine, idempotent designs simplify everything. Now, I haven't defined idempotent here, but I have talked about it before. Idempotent means that running the same operation n times is the same as doing it once. So adding an item to a hash set or adding an item to a dictionary, those are examples of idempotent designs. So upserts are another example of this in something like SQL. They simplify everything because they allow us to go ahead and not have to have special code branches for doing things like retries or handling out of order messaging and so forth. So if you can design your state to be idempotent, this is going to greatly simplify the way your application looks. So it's a good first order design goal. Not everything can be made idempotent, but you should try. Now, one other key detail here is that if the first order effect of let's say updating the collection was a no-op, you, know, you go ahead and basically add an item that already exists to the hash set. Well, if you go ahead and don't omit any additional effects when that happens, you explicitly check to see, hey, was this a no-op after we performed this right? And you don't omit any new downstream effects. This means your secondary effects also become idempotent. It's a good example of this. We're gonna insert this customer into the database and then send them a welcome email. The welcome email is the secondary effect. Well, if you go ahead and do an upsert and say, hey, looks like this row already existed, so no new rows were created as a result of this, and you don't send the welcome email, congratulations, your welcome email is now also idempotent as well. And finally, and the most important lesson out of all of these, is that decay in software begins with details. Decay, also known as byte rot, also known as technical debt, really begins with small details inside your application. This is why I mentioned that software developers who don't wanna be bothered with details are a problem. Details are important. Your software is a collection of details. So there's some things we can do inside .NET specifically to make it easier to go ahead and not let decay seep in from the beginning. Treat warnings as errors in your build compilation system is a really good example of this. So we have this turned on on a lot of our new projects, but on older projects where we started them with a lot less experience than we do now, like Aka.NET's core library, for example, we don't have this turned on because we probably have 200 plus errors in there right now. And we have to have to go and issue kind of a big project to go back and clean them up, which, you know, we're gradually doing, but that's an example of where decay begins with these little details. You also wanna to try to inject failures into your build for small creeping details that can cumulatively add up to a bad experience. Good example of this. Make sure your code samples are always referenced from a runnable solution. So we use docfx mentions for this, or you can use a library like markdown snippets to go ahead and do that. Another example is check for broken links in the documentation. We run docfx with treat warnings as errors turned on on the Akadonet project, so we can find when there's a link to documentation that doesn't exist. That'll raise a build warning, and that'll go ahead and fail the build when that happens. So you wanna to try to make sure you champion excellence down to the smallest details always. This doesn't mean becoming the obnoxious coding standards guy and trying to force everyone to use a super opinionated editor.config file or anything like that. But it does mean when you're reviewing a pull request and you see something that's off, you should just err on the side of saying something. Better to be a nitpicker and not let these details go by unnoticed and make sure you're always being a champion for quality within your work and within your team's output at all times. You will end up with better results 
And you will end up, by the way, with team members who are conscientious about these things too. As long as you lead by example and you always make sure you scrutinize your own code as much as everyone else's. So thank you very much for watching. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. And thank you for 10 years of support. We really appreciate it. Have a good one.